For me, um, family abolition is about the proliferation of relationships of care, not a kind of destruction of the relationships we already have. Um, the word abolition um, in other contexts, like Ruthie Wilson Gilmore's prison abolition, um, is something she talks about as a, as a building and a transcendence of the world that we already have, not as a kind of um, simply a dismantling of the infrastructures um, that exist in this world. So that's one way of thinking about abolition as, as a, um, a process of um, building and growing um, all the kind of uh, forms of love and care and solidarity that we deserve. I think my book is essentially um, a kind of uh, announcement that we, we, we all deserve more, we all deserve more mothers amongst other things. Um, and so it, it wouldn't be a question of, um, you know, looking at these situations where families, for example, at the border between the US and Mexico are being uh, torn apart. There are some on the left who say that um, capitalism and the neoliberal state have already been abolishing the family for quite some time. Um, uh, but I'm with Melinda Cooper's history, uh, family values on this. Um, Cooper insists that uh, the family is actually just as important as it has ever been to neoliberal and ne neoconservative uh, govern governance. Um, and we can see this amongst other things at places like the US-Mexico border where the nuclear private household um, is the form that you have to ape to have a chance um, at being able to pass into the US. Um, and of course, strategically, it makes sense to assert um, the importance of respecting family bonds um, when we do migrant solidarity work. Um, but I, I think we can also push against the limits of that framework by showing that um, uh, agreeing with the sacredness of the family um, throws migrants who are refugees from the normative family under the bus. Um, it throws refugees under the bus who don't belong in a family unit or aren't traveling in one. And we can see um, the limits of a sort of pro-family resistance um, in things like the policy that the Trump administration has now floated to test uh, migrants um, biogenetically to try and ascertain whether they are fake families. Um, so family abolition isn't something that capitalism um, achieves or uh, fascist border regimes um, achieves. Capitalism and um, capitalist states uh, rely really heavily on the family um, as a unit of uh, social discipline, social order, um, austerity, and um, a source of huge amounts of unpaid labor. Um, in the history of feminism, um, abolishing the family uh, was, you know, very uh, well known as a demand, in the, particularly in the 60s and 70s, amongst uh, certain strands of women's liberation, including Shulamith Firestone's famous um, The Dialectic of Sex, where she talks about children's uh, liberation and uh, a world in which um, children and women would have much more autonomy over the households uh, in which they uh, live. Um, she talks about a right to transfer out for children um, of households that aren't working for them. Um, it's feminists who have mounted an analysis of the private nuclear household as the site of the overwhelming majority of the rape and abuse um, that takes place on earth. And gay liberationists have called for uh, the abolition of the nuclear family um, for a very long time. Utopian socialists used to know about this demand. I was recently in an archive in West Philadelphia where I live um, looking through pamphlets um, from the 60s and 70s and abolishing the nuclear family is mentioned in many of them. There's a certain forgetfulness, I think, that's taken place um, on the revolutionary and radical left about family abolition. Um, I think we've forgotten how to dream
that big. Family abolition means that we deserve more. We deserve more than the sort of blackmail that tells us that we must be content with relationships uh, defined as blood um, or as nature, um, the relationships we find uh, given to us. Um, it means that um, we could develop forms of comradeliness, forms of um, chosen, uh, or in the phrase of the xenofeminists, sort of xenofam. Um, that's a term that they uh, contrast to biofam. Um, the important point being to um, insist that biofam, the relations we are given, are not necessarily worse than or inferior to xenofam, the pol sort of political chosen engagements we have. It's just uh, to insist that xenofam can be as good as, at least as good as, um, relationships of sort of uh, biological or biogenetic um, nature. Some people like to talk about pregnancy as a nine month head start to a relationship. And um, having learned a little bit more about the biology of gestation in our species, I have to say I'm really relieved that we have different ways of relating to one another uh, postpartum. Because the way that a gestator and a gestatee, a fetus, interact is really fascinating and in some ways beautiful and sublime, um, but it's also very violent. And I want us to be able to think about the brutality inside relationships of care. Um, but I also am hopeful that uh, we could assist and uh, supplement and attenuate uh, the ways in which we hold and manufacture one another, um, including, you know, before a baby is born, I'm interested in thinking about how um, pregnancy could be redistributed uh, rendered more safe, more pleasurable, uh, maybe partially automated. Um, but this is partly, um, you know, the, insisting on the, um, on the actual mechanics of gestation in Homo sapiens um, is, is important, I think, because, not because I, I want to, you know, um, scare people or, um, uh, you know, insist on a kind of body horror that doesn't line up with some people's experience of doing gestating. Um, but it's, uh, it's a way into thinking about um, how difficult um, the politics of work and workers struggle in some types of areas, including especially care, uh, is for a revolutionary left interested in um, ultimately abolishing uh, work um, or it, and what abolishing work means um, in some contexts is um, a sort of minimization of the workness of work. It, even after we um, have achieved a utopia, a queer gestational reproductive commune, there will still be labor that we are doing uh, to make one another. Um, but what I'm sort of trying to target is the unacceptable um, element of our current organization of gestational labor, the element that is um, work, alienated labor, um, unacceptably unsafe, injurious, uh, lethal to, in fact, about 300,000 people a year, because that's the statistic um, telling us how many people die doing pregnancy every year, according to the UN. Um, so, um, a fetus uh, in some species um, is something that can actually quite easily be sort of uh, dropped <laughs> if you encounter a drought or a traumatic situation. Um, in many species, um, you know, mama comes first um, and uh, life can go on fairly, uh, it, life can go on as normal during a pregnancy. But um, in our species, the hemochorial placenta uh, takes over many of our functions and sort of locks into our anatomies um, 
in such a way as to ensure that, um, to put it in a slightly gruesome way, uh, the last thing to die in a human is the pregnancy. Um, and so, I, you know, that's why I say, as the opening of my book, um, it is a wonder we let fetuses inside us. Um, it commands a hell of a lot of respect, I think, uh, in me, <laughs> that people do this kind of uh, labor um, on a regular basis, and that so many of us are walking around in a state of physical implantability. Um, there are forms of work, um, perhaps um, not talked about sufficiently, um, similar to gestating in the sense that we are doing them um, in our sleep. Um, and I want to extend our ability to think about um, labors that we have imperfect control over, uh, labors that it's difficult to withdraw, uh, forms of work that um, were one to withdraw them, um, there might be a bloody consequence. We're facing a really terrifying attack on abortion in the US where I live, in Northern Ireland and elsewhere. Um, and in this context, I think it's actually really important to think about the strategies we use to defend abortion. Um, we're not winning, we're losing spectacularly when it comes to abortion. Um, and in the past, the strategies that um, our side has tended to use have included a kind of uh, seeding of ground to our enemies. We tend to say um, that abortion is indeed very bad, but, or we say, um, luckily it's not killing, luckily it's just a healthcare right. Um, and this is an important argument, um, which in some ways I agree with. Um, I, I agree that abortion is a form of healthcare. Um, but, um, we have very little to lose at the moment when it comes to abortion, and I'm interested in winning radically. And I wonder if we could think about defending abortion as a right to stop doing gestational work. Many people actually come to their support for abortion through doing gestation. Many of the most committed supporters of abortion are people who have um, loving and uh, wanted experiences of pregnancy that have gone on to become parenting relationships. Um, abortion is, in my opinion, um, and I recognize how controversial this is, um, a form of killing. It is a, a form of um, killing that uh, we need to be able to defend. Um, I am not interested in where a human life starts to um, exist. Um, I see the forms of making and unmaking each other as sort of continuous processes. Um, the other end of the spectrum is the process of learning how to die well and hold each other and let each other go at the end of our lives as well as at the beginning. Um, but looking at the biology of this kind of hemochorial placentation helps me think about um, the violence that, innocently, a fetus meets out vis-a-vis um, -vis a gestator. Um, and that violence is, is an unacceptable violence for someone who doesn't want to do gestational work. Um, the violence that that gestator meets out to essentially go on strike or exit <laughs> that, that workplace is an acceptable violence. Uh, that I am prepared to defend under any circumstances. In the commercial gestational surrogacy industry, um, a, a lack of informed consent is rife. There's a terrible lack of um, uh, autonomy that workers face over their obstetric uh, experiences. Um, there are uh, uh, C-sections forced on people. There is um, wage skimming, underpayment, um, surveillance, um, all kinds of uh, bad working conditions that gestational surrogates are, as workers, naming, um, resisting, making demands over.
Um, that struggle um, on the workplace, uh, in the workplace, on the shop floor, that struggle on the shop floor of the uh, commercial gestational surrogacy industry um, is not something that the feminist opponents of surrogacy seem to be very interested in. Um, much uh, in the same way that um, anti-prostitution and anti-trafficking feminisms uh, have often sort of spoken over the heads of uh, sex workers um, in the name of sort of rescuing um, people in the sex industry from their work. Lots of quite prominent um, public figures, including Guardian journalists, um, uh, Julie Bindle, Kaiser Ekis Ekman, um, are really dedicated to fighting at the level of the EU and the Hague and the UN um, against what they call um, womb trafficking uh, or a contemporary form of slavery, as they call it. Um, and this completely ignores um, the desires and stated wishes of uh, the gestational workers on the shop floor of this industry. Um, the, um, the fear um, that many feminists have about surrogacy is a, in many ways, well-justified one, that um, people's poverty um, is being exploited in a way uh, that goes beyond um, the exploitation that people face in basically every industry under capitalism. But this attitude that um, people with viable uteruses who sign up to uh, provide a gestational service um, cannot make decisions for themselves, um, should not be listened to when they insist that that situation and that work is preferable to them um, compared to what they were doing before. Uh, that's, a, that's a form of bioconservative, top-down, um, humanitarian, and often very um, unintentionally harmful kind of feminism. Um, we need to listen to the sex workers um, in their arguments that became successful after several decades of um, struggle convincing organizations like Amnesty International to support full decriminalization instead of um, the Nordic model um, in that context. Um, that's, that's a, a proposal on the part of um, uh, people like Julie Bindle to criminalize the buyer, um, which hopes not to have any effects on the workers um, who interact with those buyers. In the surrogacy industry, the similarities seem to me to be quite striking, although there are limits to the comparison. Um, in gestational surrogacy, there are children being produced, and I do, of course, pay attention to that, um, and I think that's important. Um, why I call for uh, full surrogacy now, um, it's a surprising demand um, in the context of an industry that strikes people rightly um, as very dystopian. Um, the solution to a situation where people are being uh, manufactured as property um, is not to eliminate that industry as though going back to what there was before could be a solution. The assisted reproductive industry and commercial surrogacy is a logical extension of a situation in which um, children uh, conceived of biogenetically are the sort of natural belongings of the people who think of themselves as, as their parents. Um, this is why um, while some people worry that the surrogacy industry is sort of uh, anti-natural, it's actually the place where you get the most virulent uh, expressions of um, biogenetics as fate, um, parentage as something really cut and dried, guaranteed, um, and uh, 
the nuclear family as an image of um, sacred uh, order, not to be um, queered or troubled or uh, subverted in any way. So why do I think that you can look at the gestational surrogacy industry, this place sort of dedicated to you know, the most um, extreme expressions of propertarian uh, biogenetic kinship? Um, it's because the workers in that industry have experience of doing unpaid and paid pregnancy, um, and they have things to say about the difference or rather the lack of a difference between those two things. They have little glimpses um, of a world in which um, the, f the fact of uh, pregnancy uh, could be a, a process for everyone and to some extent by everyone. Extending that logic, you know, right to its conclusion to, to think back to the demands of lesbian feminists, black Marxist feminists, queer feminists from the 80s who were asserting things like um, all children um, belong to everyone. Or in the phrase of the sisterhood of black single mothers, uh, children won't belong to patriarchy in the future and they won't belong to us either. They will belong only to themselves. It's kind of a question of squinting at this um, dystopia to think about what could come beyond it if we took some of the sort of um, cracks and fissures in its own logic really seriously and tried to sort of um, peek through to uh, sort of radically um, collectivized, pluralized, communized, uh, gestational reality to come. Um, yeah, in the 1980s there were um, some surrogacy scandals, some of the first, um, notably in the matter of Baby M, which is a drama that unfolded in New Jersey between a working class uh, woman who already had several children of her own, um, had been a sex worker, as the press later insisted on mentioning, um, and had accepted a sum of money from some uh, doctors uh, some well-heeled people in her uh, community to bear a child for them that would have been that would be conceived from her egg. Um, this is called traditional surrogacy um, and almost never happens in a commercial setting nowadays. Um, traditional surrogacy has been replaced by what is called gestational surrogacy where the um, surrogate worker shares no genetic material whatsoever with the fetus that she is um, creating. Um, Mary Beth Whitehead, um, the surrogate in the Baby M case, um, changed her mind about relinquishing uh, the product of her gestational labour and uh, sort of went AWOL in a big drama that resulted in a court prosecution that went all the way up to the Supreme Court. People campaigned, um, coalitions against surrogacy were uh, founded. Mary Beth Whitehead didn't win the case, um, but the industry as a whole um, uh, never recovered from uh, that drama. Um, the surrogacy industry is now um, uh, characterized by distance. Um, uh, the work has been outsourced to um, the Global South, where uh, the buyers um, need not necessarily ever meet or think about um, the person whose uterus uh, their son or daughter has actually um, been manufactured in. Um, while this was going on in the 80s, um, black feminists were looking on and saying things like uh, new reproductive technology, this doesn't seem so new. Angela Davis famously um, uh, made the argument that um, what was being called surrogacy um, is not a new reproductive technology, but a phenomenon that renders the fragmentation of maternity and the stratification 
of maternity in the white supremacist settler colony that is the United States more obvious and more apparent. This is a line of argument that has been um, leveled by um, critics of The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, um, who noticed early on, even before the Hulu TV series adaptation made the problem more stark uh, than, than it is in the novel, um, that The Handmaid's Tale is a de-raced slave narrative that tries to take the experience of forced surrogacy on the plantation um, and think about it as a universal uh, emblem of female suffering. Um, in The Handmaid's Tale, uh, the fantasy that I think we are encouraged to enjoy is that um, under conditions of forced surrogacy in a totalitarian state, um, cisgender womanhood sort of united uh, in, a, in, a, in a full feminism uh, that no one could, um, no one with the exception of some aunts uh, could um, withstand the, you know, uh, um, the, you know, the, 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 like, you know what I mean? What am I trying to say? Um, in The Handmaid's Tale, um, all women, with the exception of some aunts, are feminists. Um, this is a fantasy of sort of cisgender womanhood defined by womb farming um, or their exclusion from it on the basis of being uh, unwomen. But there is no white supremacy in The Handmaid's Tale to speak of, um, particularly in the Hulu series, which its director admitted uh, had been simplified such that it was uh, a diverse society where fertility trumps all. The uh, historic connection of um, enslaved women um, and the black descendants of enslaved women in contemporary America to surrogacy is something that um, the, uh, the anti-surrogacy feminists um, of our moment are really uh, invested in, um, in eliding. The history of um, black feminism has involved, uh, for obvious reasons, a defense of black families. And I want to be completely clear that family abolition uh, is not something um, that would result in the shattering of uh, black communities. It's kind of the opposite. The family abolitionism I'm talking about is, comes from queer black feminists and black Marxists, including Angela Davis. Um, more contemporary examples of, this, of the kind of thinking I'm, I'm talking about um, is in a collection called Revolutionary Mothering, edited by Maya Williams and Alexis Pauline Gums. Alexis Pauline Gums um, proposes that uh, in the United States, black mothering has always been queer, um, and that the practices of Black polymaternalism, which is to say um, the practice of um, multiple mothers and uh, distributed mothering that have sort of flourished particularly in racially marginalized communities um, under conditions of white supremacy and capitalist settler colonialism. These are um, sort of non-kinship kinships um, and non-family forms of um, survival. Um, the language here is sort of slippery, um, but I, I'd sort of propose that what we're thinking about in this context is um, a, a kind of queer proliferation of families um, against the family, with a, with a capital F, if you like. Um, of course, there are strands of um, black feminism that um, assert um, black kinship and the black family, the black private nuclear household um, as a sort of uh, uh, good to be seized, similarly to the way that some uh, forms of gay liberation and queer struggle have claimed marriage um, as a form that is needed, that equal access should exist to. Um, but at the same time, there have always been strands of um, 
black liberatory thought that have rejected uh, the notion of the nuclear family as an invention that was predicated on uh, black people's exclusion. And this is something that Hortense Spillers, among others, were thinking about in the context uh, of the, the, the slave plantation, where the naturalness of the nuclear family was predicated on, um, if you like, the surrogates who were sort of excised from the family photo. The racialized labors, including bodily labors such as wet nursing, and in some cases, surrogate gestating that wasn't thought of yet in that way, but was invisibilized um, and kept under silence. Or, you know, simply um, in, 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 in slave plantations where black, gestation, black gestators, uh, babies didn't belong to them and became instantly the property of their masters, um, that, that situation of sort of um, invisibilized sort of surrogateness has been the story all along. And that's the sense in which there has been surrogacy for a very long time, um, a kind of uh, unjust surrogacy, which I'm obviously not um, suggesting should be intensified or expanded. Um, Angela Davis has been sort of telling us that surrogates were there before. Surrogates have been around. There is no natural, natural nuclear family. The natural nuclear family in its private household is an artificial uh, fiction sustained only by the sort of invisible stagehands who are usually racialized proletarians around that, um, that infrastructure. Um, and while, um, you know, proletarian and black families, um, you know, ha are often encouraged and disciplined into aping the form of the, of the bourgeois household, um, in reality, um, the way that working class, um, indigenous and um, people of color have reproduced themselves have by necessity and, you know, by desire as well, involved a whole host of kind of transgenerational um, and chosen forms of mutual aid um, and regeneration and care. Not to romanticize um, the sort of non-bourgeois household uh, because plenty of abuse um, and uh, rape and uh, scarcity exists in those domains as well. But just to say that we can glimpse something like full surrogacy now in the practices that people have deployed to survive white supremacy, slavery, colonialism and capitalist exploitation um, for many, many decades. In history, there's been um, experiments um, and ambitious projects here and there um, aimed at sort of collectivizing or, or communizing or liberating uh, childbirth. Um, it's a bit of an ambivalent record. Sometimes these experiments went kind of awry as happened in Germany with the method known as twilight sleep which was designed to completely erase the memory of labor pain, um, but which had some uh, unexpectedly catastrophic uh, neurological effects on its uh, patients. Um, in the Soviet Union, there were pregnancy camps for pregnant comrades, um, and throughout Europe and North America, there were various schools of childbirth, natural birth, um, and, um, uh, uh, throughout Europe and North America, there were various uh, schools of childbirth um, and, of course, the various strands of kind of um, natural birth that have persisted and been popular amongst sort of diverse social classes, um, with some areas uh, straying into a kind of romantic, um, repro-normative, 
uh, mystification of uh, pregnancy as uh, nature um, or a form of uh, work that it would be sublime to completely alienate yourself within and other forms of natural childbirth being a sort of um, grassroots uh, suite of gestational labor hacks and artifices, knowledges that are sort of circulated and perfected among gestators or would-be gestators um, and indeed with the sort of full spectrum doulas who are there to help uh, in the labors of miscarriage, abortion, as well as birth, and in some cases, dying. Um, you know, the, the, the knowledges include um, uh, knowledges to do with uh, strike and withdrawal and uh, the minimization of pain, the maximization of pleasure in, in all of these kinds of relations to, to gestating. Um, many scholars are now um, uh, unearthing the histories of um, uh, enslaved women in the Caribbean as well as in North America using abortifacient herbs um, including um, cotton bark on cotton plantations to exert a kind of um, autonomy um, or, or elements of decision-making power over the, uh, the gestational labor um, in which they, were, they found themselves sort of imbricated. Um, and I think um, there is something to be said for even the most problematic of the te textbooks written about a century ago um, by the pioneering midwives um, of some of these sort of uh, um, schools of childbirth experiments um, because at the time the problem of pregnancy as I'm suggesting we call it, was being talked about very frankly. There's a, um, a quote um, Irene Lustig um, talks about in her f archival film, The Motherhood Archives. Nature causes so much injury um, to women in the course of uh, their pregnancy that nature must intend for women to be used up in the process like a salmon dies after spawning. And if that's what nature intends, we are facing a problem. Nature is an ass. Nature needs to be denatured and remade. And I, I'm interested in um, thinking speculatively as well as um, quite practically um, about ways to um, minimize the harms of gestating with the help of um, you know, technologies in gestators' hands uh, to render gestating uh, less harmful as well as perhaps, uh, rah, okay, I'm not, I'm not sure how much I want to talk about biobags. Okay, I'm interested in a possible future in which, similarly to the people of Mattapoiset in Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time, um, Gestating is a process, um, a tactile one, um, that is, um, if people want it to be, um, removed from gestators' bodies, um, centralized in a sort of oceanic slurry called a brooder, or perhaps uh, thinking about the very real developments around bio bags and uh, artificial gestation of fetal sheep. Um, Perhaps a question of sort of modular, mobile, bio handbags um, in which our pregnancies could be passed off to one another, um, shared, um, and in some ways sort of um, shielded um, <laughs> from um, the defenses that our bodies necessarily kind of mount against um, a fetus's sort of um, hunger. and. I don't know how exactly this would work. This is something we will have to find out together by trying. But um, there's something in order to in order to enjoy pregnancy and liberate it from its current conditions. Um, we we need to be thinking really seriously about how to 
hack and uh, tweak bodily biology to better support and empower those of us who may or, or, or may not or may want to um, get involved in being put to work by a placenta.